Welcome to the Hey Chaplain Podcast. My name is Caleb Sackett. I'm a minister and co-worker with Jared Altick, a chaplain with the police department. This podcast exists so that cops can hear encouragement from other cops. It might not be very often that you talk to a police chaplain, but I'm hoping that you might listen to a chaplain talk to other cops about being a wiser, healthier person. On this podcast, you'll hear from detectives and dispatchers, U.S. Marshals and county sheriffs, and the occasional paramedic turned true crime author. From the LAPD to Scotland Yard, the guests on Hey Chaplin are giving you the wisdom gleaned from their experience so you don't have to learn the hard way. Maybe you're wondering, who is this guy and why is he here today? Well, I'm interested in learning more about what Jared does. I work with him, but I always want to know more about what he does in chaplaincy. So today I'm joining Jared on the show to answer listener questions that you all have asked from the mailbag. Hello, Jared. Hi, Caleb. How are you doing? I'm doing well today. How are you? I am doing pretty well. I thought maybe we could reach into the mailbag today and check out a few uh, listener questions. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I was really excited. We got several people that had asked questions, and and I trusted you to to pick out some of the best ones. I always have questions about the show and about chaplaincy. But you get to pick my brain all the time. So I'm eager to see which listener questions you picked about podcasting or chaplaincy or whatever. What's the first question? This one's from Joe G in Leavenworth. This is all about podcasting, a little bit of inside baseball here. He asks, in the world of podcasts, are there any regulations or code of conduct like TV and radio had from the FCC? If not, do you ever see that happening for podcasts in the USA? Uh, Okay, that's that's a tough question because on the surface of it, it's very straightforward. No. There's no rules. It's the Wild West. People can put whatever they want up there. In reality, there's all kinds of restrictions. So in podcasting generally, and I think this mostly comes from Apple, you have the explicit label. Right. That's the little E that you see next to something, right? And podcasters can, can label themselves as explicit, and they're supposed to. If they're using foul language, talking about vulgar things, they're supposed to put the, the explicit label up there. Um, most people in podcasting just put that label up there and then they can curse and talk about any subject they want and say any opinion they want and they, they feel like it's it's free reign. Okay. But it's not entirely. Uh, in fact, there are several countries around the world that if you have the explicit label, your podcast won't get inside their country. They control their internet and and you'll be banned. Oh, wow. And so, and so there's some limitations there. And then you have platforms that will kind of shadow ban or censor you. And so, and I do experience some of that because if I'm pro-police and the platform perceives that I'm pro-police or otherwise like conservative or anything like that, then then absolutely I don't think that the algorithms spread my message around as quickly as other things. Okay. And, and then some countries flat out censor you. If you say something on your podcast, whatever subject your podcast may be about, if you say something that is is critical of the government or advocating for some position that they don't find to be good and moral and virtuous from their point of view, uh, they they will potentially ban you. And so the question was, you know, do you see any kind of of regulation coming in the U.S., well, it already exists. It exists in Canada. It exists in a lot of countries around the world where you don't really see freedom of speech like what we have. And I think that's coming. I think that companies are already censoring you and shadow banning you, uh, depending on what your content is like. And I think the government would like to get in and censor and and control or just just make it difficult for you to reach your audience. Mm-hmm. So do I think that's going to come from the FCC? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So nothing currently at the federal level in the United States, right. but in lots of other countries. It absolutely exists other places. But it is also happening corporately to right. an extent. Right. Right. And it, what I would worry about is not so much the FCC, but the government and corporations working together, colluding mm-hmm. to block certain voices where you're not just free to say what you want to say. I feel like there's always that risk 
of being censored. Sure. And so, so I try to be very careful. I, I bleep out when when you go on a tirade and start cursing. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll bleep all that out. Just kidding. But I can't control if I'm just pro police if that won't be censored someday because it might be. That's also one of the reasons I don't want to run commercials because a sponsor can censor you. If they get upset with your message, they can pull funding that you might be depending on. So I would rather do direct support and have my listeners support the show so that I'm not beholden to a particular company and their bottom line, because that's another source of censorship. Sure. Speaking of federal regulations, guidelines, press, let's shift a little bit here to how cops are perceived today. This question comes from Claire S. from the UK. Mm -hmm. She says, how hard is it or what impact does it have on local police officers when there's negative press or stories nationally about cops that are breaking the law or abusing their role? What impact does it have on them? I mean, some cops are, are very resilient and they just let it roll off them like water off a duck's back. However, generally speaking, it's demoralizing when some cop has been discovered to be a criminal and they've been doing terrible things. And that does happen. That's always happened. That you put people into positions to, to keep the rules and they themselves don't keep the rules. And so that's not new. That's not uniquely American. Uh, I know this question is coming from the UK, but it's not unique in our place or our time in history that people have failed. And so when people fail, that potentially paints all police officers with the same brush. And that's demoralizing and discouraging. Oh, great. Some cop is giving us some bad PR and that PR may come and affect the citizens that I'm working with. And, and that's discouraging. So does it affect cops? Absolutely. But at the same time, it has always happened. Most police officers come into their career expecting to get some bad PR. They know there's going to be cops that break the law and they're going to have to turn around and arrest a fellow police officer. They understand that media is not going to be in favor of them, that they're going to be represented poorly. Uh, there's going to be people who profit off of making cops look bad. Mm -hmm. They go into their career understanding that already. And so is it demoralizing? Yes. Is it a crisis that, that boy, there's been another bad news story and this is going to lead to every cop on the force quitting their job tomorrow? Probably not. And so, so I find the officers I'm around to be pretty resilient to most of it most of the time. So what you're saying is most cops go into their job knowing it comes with the job. Yeah, yeah. You know you're going to be criticized. You know you can't make everybody happy. You're going to interact with people on their worst day. And you might have to to take away their freedom. You're going to have to put hands on them and mm -hmm. take them away. And so, so you understand going into it that you're doing something that is necessary but may not be popular with everybody. So I feel like most police officers have their mind wrapped around that pretty well. Occasionally, there'll just be like a tipping point where there's so much negative And the negative is causing a police officer to lose friends. And mm. like old acquaintances from high school won't talk to them anymore suddenly. It starts to hit at and a personal level. That that gets them. And it's like, man, that really hurts. And it's just so demoralizing and frustrating that that might start to affect an officer in his personal life and, and that kind of thing. Well, here's a follow-up also from Claire S. What gives you hope for the future of the police force in the United States? Oh, I can tell you what gives me hope. It's the cops themselves. Mm. I, I go into the police academy, and some of these officers are barely 21 years old. Some of them are much older, but, but a lot of them are pretty young. And you, you ask them, you know, why do you want to be a police officer? And the standard answers are, well, I want to be a homicide detective or a canine officer. I want to be on the SWAT team, all the exciting things. But I'm also seeing a lot of answers that are like, well, I came from a community that hated cops, mm. and I want to show the people back home that 
that a cop can be a good person and I want to help bridge that gap or I want to I want to be the the liaison between the community that hates police officers and the police department and I'm hearing stuff like that pretty commonly now and so I see young people who are on a mission to uphold law and order to protect the public and to also mend the relationship between the police department and the public and they're coming into their career wanting to do that. And so when I see that many young people on that noble of a mission, man, I feel like there's going to be a lot of them who who will be successful. They will accomplish exactly that and we'll start to see things turn around. Well, that's extremely hopeful knowing that they want to be bridge builders yeah. from the from the jump. Yeah. Yeah, they want to see reconciliation between a police department and its community. They just have a have a sense for that. They they feel that as part of their purpose, and and when they talk about it, I get hopeful. You know, all the the cynicism that's built up inside of me starts to starts to wane just a little bit. I know that you love ministering to cops, especially in their moments of need. Uh, The next question comes from Michael H. in Kansas City, Kansas. He Hmm. says, how has the leadership embraced your approach to ministering to the needs of not only the citizens you serve on a tragedy notification, but the roles the officer plays as well? The leadership. So if you're talking about the executive leadership of the department that I serve, I try to steer clear of them for the most part. Uh, I know that they could pull the plug on a chaplaincy program at any moment. And and so I just try to be very useful, very supportive, uh, and not ever, ever, ever cause them any trouble. But I don't interact with them very much. And so the leadership that I do interact with are more at the sergeant and captain's level. Those guys I see regularly, and they are making decisions on crime scenes and on whether or not to have dispatch you know, send a chaplain out to a scene. And when I get there, I'm interacting and getting information from them. And we're collaborating together to help kind of solve what needs to be solved as far as as far as dealing with the family members of crime victims and and, you know, managing the police officers themselves and doing follow ups on the officers and, you know, making sure they're OK. And and that kind of work is being done with those middle level commanders. And so those supervisors are very supportive. Okay, good. And and I just I have really developed good relationships with them and I feel like they see the chaplains as useful to what they're doing and managing their officers and managing the crime scenes and investigations and that sort of thing. Uh, I think that that we're useful to to them and appreciate it. So so if you're talking about the supervisors that I actually interact with, I think they're big fans. <laughs> but if if you're talking about the people at executive levels, well I hope I'm developing a good reputation with them. Excellent. Well, let's talk a little bit more about maybe how someone becomes a chaplain in the first place. I think there are a lot of listeners who are interested in that topic. Gary J from Kansas City, Missouri asks how does a preacher get selected to be a police chaplain? Could an Islamic person be a police chaplain? Are there any Jewish rabbis? Yes, absolutely. In first responder chaplaincy across the United States, we have have Muslim people, Jewish people, Christian people, Buddhist people, non-religious people mm-hmm. who are all chaplains. Yes, it's a it comes from Christian tradition that you have chaplains, and certainly in the United States, the vast majority of chaplains are some variety of of Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox Christians. But we have a wide variety, and that's perfectly okay. Uh, for a governmental organization to employ a chaplain in the first place, you even if they're just volunteers, you, you really typically want a variety because your citizens and the people working for that organization are going to have a variety of different faiths. If you had a monolithic group, you know, where you're everybody in the entire community was only one religion, mm-hmm. it wouldn't make sense for the chaplain to match them. But odds are you're going to have a diverse group and you're going to want to have chaplains who can be flexible. Now, I don't like the idea of, well, we're only going to deploy the Jewish chaplain to the Jewish community 
Mm-hmm. And the rest of the time, he sits on a shelf waiting to be used. Yeah. You know, I think that a chaplain needs to be able to respond to, to any group and provide basic pastoral care. Can I perform the rites and rituals of the Catholic Church if I'm not Catholic? Well, no. But, but I certainly can assist them and get them to a Catholic priest. And I think any chaplain can provide that kind of service. So as far as, like, what background do you come from? religious, non-religious, one religion versus a different religion. Is that critically important? No. Any good, well-trained chaplain can be plugged in any place. But the first part of his question... I was going to ask you about that. Is there really a selection process or is it just about maybe (laughs) getting interested from the start? This varies dramatically from agency to agency. A lot of times agencies don't know what to do with chaplains or how to recruit chaplains. And so they end up having to field solicitations where someone wants to be a chaplain and they have to decide, okay, how do we onboard this person? They're interested. How do we help make it happen? And so for me, my predecessor was a police chaplain. I went several years not being involved at all, but I had cops in my church I felt like, boy, that is something I could do. And I just gradually, over the course of several years, developed an interest. Once I got that interest, I went and got some training. And then I approached the local chaplain organization and the police department. And the two of those groups together helped onboard me. I went through interview process and, and background checks and, and all kinds of things to see if I was a person that they could trust. And, and then I had to prove that I had some skill set that I could bring to the table. Right. But, but there's not one way to bring somebody on. And there's lots of organizations around the country that are like, well, this is what a chaplain, this is how a chaplain should be trained. Well, I have an opinion on that, too. Because I went to Bible college, got a degree in theology and pastoral ministry, Mm -hmm. and spent 25 years working in a church. I feel like that's the ideal way to prepare someone for police chaplaincy. But of course I feel that way. That's what I did, right? (laughs) And so so you may say instead, no, 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 no. The right way is to put somebody through CPE and have them trained up as a hospital chaplain. Okay. And then they can transition from the hospital over to first responders. Well, that also could work. You also have organizations that certify chaplains and what they need to do is go through all of the certifications from that organization and that would make them a qualified chaplain. And that also works. And so depending on what part of the country you're in and what organizations you're interacting with, they may require a theological degree from a seminary. They may not require that. They might want CPE. They may not require that. Uh, It's clinical pastoral education. Right. And so and so they may require any number of things or any number of certifications and then you can go right next door to the next suburb to a different agency and they wouldn't require any of those things. So it's it's inconsistent and you say, "Well, we should pick the one that works." Well, here's the problem. They all produce chaplains who are effective and and useful and and do good ministry. And they also produce people who don't. I, I hate to say it, but some of the, f- the finest people I've ever met are chaplains, but also some of the biggest goofballs I've ever met are chaplains. And that is just true that in any professional field, you're going to have people who really excel at what they trained for, uh, regardless of how they were trained. And then you have people who don't excel no matter how much you train them. You can give them the best training and the best education, and they just can't. They're just not called to it. So there's there's going to be highs and lows. And there's going to be a spectrum of, of people and their ability. And so you run the risk any time that there's somebody out there that is just not clicking and they're not good mm-hmm. at it. And they're always tripping over themselves. You always run the risk of one bad chaplain destroying an entire chaplain program. And and that unfortunately does happen. And there are agencies that don't have a chaplain now because they had a bad chaplain 20 years ago. So you need to have someone who has a desire to do it, mm-hmm. but also they need to have some type of skill set and uh, particular abilities that they can bring to bear on that task. Many agencies will ask 
you know, that you at least have five years of relevant experience? Are you, have you worked in a church? Have you been a, a counselor somewhere? Have you, you know, something like that? A lot of them would love to see relevant education. Do you have a seminary degree? Do you have a degree in counseling or, or something like that? But at the same time, I know chaplains who were police officers who spent, you know, 10 or 20 years doing peer support and with very little extra training or education, they're fantastic chaplains. So, so there's just not one way to do it. And the military and the law enforcement especially are very hyper-organized, process-driven organizations. Like, this is how we make chaplains. We put them in one end of the machine, we turn the crank, and out comes a chaplain at the other end of the machine. If only it were that simple. It, it, but it just isn't. And so there's going to be people who have a talent for it, just an aptitude, mm -hmm. a passion. And some of those people without a lot of formal education are going to be fantastic chaplains. And there's others that, like I said, they can have every degree from the finest institutions and they just are not capable of being effective. You mentioned that when people want to become a chaplain, much like you yourself did, they can go to their local organization or association, but there might not be one in conjunction with every law enforcement agency. Jeff C. from Rio Rancho, New Mexico asks, how do you get a chaplain program started in your agency? There are thousands of law enforcement agencies that do not have chaplains. More don't than do. I didn't know that. Here in New Mexico, about 10% of the agencies have chaplains. I think it's one big reason why so many officers are struggling on the inside. Yeah, I, and I, I don't disagree with them. So, so how do you get one started? I was fortunate. I came into an organization that, that had already existed, the Chaplains Association, that had existed for decades. The groundwork was already laid mm -hmm. as far as how you know do we have chaplains relate to our police department, our fire department, our sheriff's office. So I was very fortunate with that. The best thing you can do is go to the executive that is in your local area. So if that's the sheriff, if that's the chief of police, if that's the chief of the fire department, then you go go to them and see if you can sell them on the idea of having a chaplain's association or having a chaplain corps or having just even a single chaplain. Maybe you're in a small situation where you're really just talking about you as an individual volunteering. Mm -hmm. But if you can sell them on that, they probably have enough power to let you volunteer. And if you volunteer and show them that you're willing to invest long term to give them years of consistent service and that you can be useful without interfering, mm -hmm. you're not going to get involved in the departmental politics. You're not going to, to interrupt or interfere with investigations. You're not going to g try to weasel into to personnel issues. You are going to be there to support officers and and minister to people in a way that is acceptable for that governmental organization. If you can sell them on that, they'll probably let you volunteer. And that may be the beginning of a new chaplain's association in your locale. That's easier said than done because sometimes those chiefs or those sheriffs, you know, they're swapping out every few years mm -hmm. and and the next election comes through and, and the sheriff's gone and there's a new sheriff. Are you going to be kept on or not? Well, the truth is you're probably you're, you're probably always going to be at risk of that. And so you may be repeatedly selling. This is this is what we provide. We're providing this at little or no cost. We need minimal support from you. We just need access to your firefighters. We just need access to your police officers. And and we can be there to help with the death notifications and we can be there to mitigate the the alcohol abuse and the divorce rate and the suicide rate and all those kind of things. Right. We can help try to make a dent in those areas of officer wellness. It's worth it to have us on here. There's very little risk. But as soon as a bad chaplain comes along and abuses that access, well, you may find it very difficult to make that case uh, if they've got a bad taste in their mouth with a bad experience. Sure. So it comes down to networking, being present, forming relationships with people, and showing that you want to be there for the long term. It's, it's just yep. like with any other endeavor that a person wants to start. It takes a person who is 
committed and is going to really put in the work necessary to keep something sustained. What I worry is that there are people who approach the new sheriff and say, hey, I'd like to be a law enforcement chaplain for your deputies. And they make all these promises. And then the sheriff realizes, yeah, I've got someone struggling. I got a, I got a d- deputy who's going through a divorce and he's, he's depressed and he needs to talk to somebody. So I'm going to call the chaplain. You can't get a hold of him. The chaplain's nowhere to be found. Well, has the chaplain been visiting the station? No, nope, we've not seen him in six months. And I worry that there's people who want to help that are not going to follow through. Mm. And so I would rather those people just not ever ask in the first place. But if you think you can help, maybe you're retired law enforcement, you already have some of that cultural competency, and you want to really dig in and be like, I am going to be here, then, then if you're willing to make that commitment, then go ask the sheriff, go ask the police chief, and see if they'll let you in. But, but if you're not willing to make the commitment, man, you, you end up doing more damage than anything. When I first started, I had officers from a different department. I was talking to them about about it and what I need to do and the training I was just starting to get. And they they warned me the the one thing you can that would hurt us the worst is if we called you and you can't you don't show up. If we please come if we need you. If we call you, you have to respond. And and that was the biggest thing to them because obviously they'd had a bad experience with calling chaplains. It just they were always out of pocket. You can mm-hmm. never find them. They were never available. They were always busy. When I became a chaplain, I gave up a lot of other stuff. I was on the HOA board. I was on several parachurch ministry boards. And and I quit all of those so I could do this. And so if you're going to have 20 different irons in the fire, police chaplaincy is probably not for you. If you're willing to give up some of those other things and trim back some of those other hobbies and activities and social things, if you're, if you're willing to cut back on a bunch of that and make time for it, then you could be a chaplain and you could maybe even start a new chaplaincy program. Well, let's take a look at your own chaplaincy position. Claire from the UK, once again, asks, do you live in your role as a chaplain from day to day? Or do you have aspirations of where it might be or what you might be doing in five years, 10 years? You know, in other words, are you just taking it one day at a time and just seeing what happens? Or do you have goals and places that, that you want to be as a chaplain in the future? Okay. I, I'm trying to understand what she meant exactly because there are people who become chaplains because they want to have breakfast with the mayor. And they have aspirations to go on and have a political career or to make other connections. And, and chaplaincy is a stepping stone to, to gain access to people who are movers and shakers and politically powerful and whatever. I have no interest in something like that. I am doing what I want to do right now. Uh, in fact, I was teasing with another chaplain the other day. I don't even want to be the head chaplain of my own association. I would love to bring on some other chaplains and let them run the organization. I'm already doing what I want to do. I I want to minister to 25 and 30 year old police officers who are in patrol in my city. That is what I want to do. And I'm already doing it. So I don't need a promotion. I don't need a paycheck. I don't need anything that I'm, there's nothing I'm aspiring to in that way. This is not a stepping stone for me. There are some chaplains who this is a stepping stone, and that's not always bad. It, it could be like, hey, I'm going to do this for a short period of time until I acquire what I want to do to do my next thing in life. And life has chapters, and so I'm only going to be a chaplain for a little while. They can still help. I mean, there's there's a way to use a chaplain like that. Mm-hmm. But my heart is with the ones who are like, I want to do this till I can't do it anymore. And so for me, if if I think about how my career as a chaplain will develop, I am building bonds with officers who are in the front half of their career. So 10, 15 years from now, a lot of them will be at the back half of their career. They may be the new police chief or whatever. And so that will change a little bit where I've been so focused on the youngest officers as I get older, and especially as I get more than just one generation older than when I'm two generations older than them, and I'm, I've got a, you know, whatever hair I have left is gray, and, <laughs> and I'm more grandfatherly, 
I, I could imagine being like an advisor to a police chief and kind of pastoring older officers who are in executive positions. Um, and maybe I wouldn't be out on patrol quite as much when I'm that far into my chaplaincy. But I can't picture that yet because right now my heart is with the officers who are out there and they're stressed and they've got young families and I want to help them. Right. And so I can't imagine like just going to police headquarters, even if I really know those guys really well. I still think I want to be out in the patrol car. Maybe that'll change when I'm 65 or 70 years old, but, but, but five years from, from now, yeah. <laughs> but five years from now, you think still going to be doing what you're doing right now. My, you my intention, my intention is that the officers that I'm building bonds with now all graduate from me. Uh, almost all of them. Some of them stay in patrol, but most of them are going to retire. They're going to get, get promoted. They're going to become detectives. They're going to move on. And and I'll see them once in a while when our jo- when our you know paths intersect. But but I'll go to the academy and 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 be introduced to a new cadre of recruits, and and those will be the officers that I'm with the next ten years. And every year I'll add a few more, and I'll lose a few more. And that's that's the mode I'm in right now, and I'm I'm very happy with that. So I don't see any reason to change that for me personally. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time not only to do the podcast, but to uh, answer some listener questions and give us all a little bit more uh, information on the podcast and on the world of policing right now, and also on what it takes to be a chaplain. Caleb, I really appreciate you coming in today and helping me with this. Uh, We work together every day, and you're a minister that I respect, but you have a participation in my chaplaincy that goes beyond just listening to the show. You also minister to the first responders that attend our church. And so you're participating in their lives and in their families' lives and trying to help them be happier and healthier. And that means a lot to me. And so I just appreciate what you do as well. Well, thank you. Love the show. Happy to to be here and to help a little bit. And hope Hey Chaplain has many more years to come. Thank you. This show is commercial free because listeners buy Jared a $5 virtual coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash heychaplain. You don't have to do that. You already get the show for free. But thank you for supporting. It means the world to Jared. The views expressed here are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the views of any law enforcement agency or its components. If you liked this episode, please share it with a cop or someone who loves a cop. Thank you for listening to Hey Chaplain, and as always, pray for peace in our city.